Okay, so this is Nikki and Claire back for another podcast for our COVID walks to help you identify the plants that you see on your walks. I'm Nikki, I'm a horticulture advisor at the RHS and I've previously worked with Claire teaching at Hadlow College where she is, what are you Claire? Um, <laughs> it's a leading question. I'm Claire Lakey and I'm the programme lead for garden design at Hadlow College. Um, um, this is HE Garden Design. It's a, a degree course. Why, why do you miss that bit out? That's a little bit weird. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I suppose I'm used to saying I did my degree there 20 odd years ago and at Greenwich University. So I'm glad to be back at Hadlow. Hmm. Right, so this week, obviously, we've been doing um, walks in our completely different areas of the country. Um, well, whilst they're both the southeast, they've got quite different microclimates and everything. So, Claire, you start off. This was one of your photos. Um, so I'm walking around East Dulwich and Dulwich Village, and the start of the show this week has definitely been wisteria. And I saw this. Um, there's loads of wisteria around, and it's the air on those warm evenings has been really heavily scented, which is always um, really surprising for me. I'm always kind of captivated by the experience of wisteria. And I thought this was a particularly lovely image. Someone's made this neon sign to thank the NHS. So I thought that was a good starting point. And next to it as well. Very seasonal, isn't it? It's... Yeah. Um, so this, this um, uh, um, ident for us was about seasonality. What, was, what are the stars? What's happening? Seasonality in terms of garden design, I'm always speaking to my students about how we reflect the seasons in people's gardens. And I think that's, it's, it's really important that um, as professionals, I, we want to give the best experience to our clients. And also to, to demonstrate, actually, because lots of people, especially when they start off in gardening, are always, oh, I just want something evergreen. And, and actually, you don't, you know, whilst there's some fabulous evergreen shrubs, you still need that seasonality. You don't want a shrub that's going to be looking the same yeah. all the time throughout the year. Otherwise, you'll never know what season it is. There are, there are some, and we've got some to talk about today, mm. but they've got to be with something else. Otherwise... How do you know whether it's spring? You know it's spring, the wisteria are flowering, don't you? And it, it's, um, there's a lovely, um, when everything is very static, there's a very um, low energy in a garden. And it's almost funereal. If you have lots of kind of dusty conifers and lots of evergreens, it's very flat energy. There's, kind of, there's, there's no joy. And nature is full of joy. and um, you don't have any flowers it's easy to look after but the colour and the variety and the seasonality the movement in the garden is is not there and that's kind of almost goes against nature really yeah and actually that that's striving particularly in communal gardens sometimes i think for low maintenance which is just some very basic evergreens and lots of grasses nowadays that's grasses is the big thing but sometimes that, it is just dull there's no reason that you can't have <laughs> low maintenance things that flower and lose their leaves yeah. and have autumn color um it, it's it's a myth i think that um that things that aren't evergreen or, or grasses for example that need more care um, everything needs some form of looking after at some point. Um, um, yes, so you might as well embrace that. I think that's right. This whole idea of having a low maintenance garden and therefore you have to sacrifice colour. Wisteria is a good example yeah. of people are really, really put off by it because it's really complicated. But um, we will talk about that maybe in another podcast, but actually it's really, actually very easy to look after. Very satisfying. We will talk about, actually we'll talk about pruning wisteria in July when you need to prune it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another, another little picture here about the kindness and more people are out in their gardens and they're offering their, um, their herbs to people. 
And um, I found that it's in lots of different areas around here. So it's books and herbs being left out on walls. Um, so I thought that yeah, was really lovely. Good. Yeah. So our next slide, a bit more of the wisteria getting close up. Um, particularly enjoy taking these photographs. Um, but the family, we haven't, we haven't talked about this, but the family of um, wisteria. Leguminaceae, is it? I th yeah, I think it is. Yeah, because you, you can see the pea like. Um, yes. See, I'm sorry, I'm just, I love that red colour on the leaves, on, on the new leaves as they come out. There's, there's sort of a, a fawny brown, aren't they? And, yeah. And, and that's an, yet another sort of layer to what wisteria can do. Um, and I think one of the great things about seasonality is it's not just about flowers. So this is, these images are just showing all this, uh, the beautiful subtleties and the colour, but the foliage at the moment, the new foliage, it's all lovely and soft and green and in miniature, but often in different, we're having a different colour. So it's not just flowers, although we're concentrating quite a bit on flowers at the moment. He might have phoned me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna chuck my phone over there. There, that's, that's right. better. Um, foliage. And yes. also the reason why you're gonna have, a, you're gonna have full sight of these flowers now is because the foliage is just emerging. So the flowers are out before, the foliage and then the foliage starts to take over and then the flowers diminish so. yeah and they are beautiful and and so long this year some of them seem to be mm. like actually that's one of the things i, I 30, know 40, talked about. 45 centimeters long yeah and actually i might have to go when we're doing hopefully we're going to do another podcast about climbers i've got to go and walk over to dulwich village again to get these get the measuring tape with these they were, they were about 80 centimetres. I was, I, I was just flabbergasted. Yeah, just looking a bit weird. so much longer this year, and I don't know whether that was because we had a mild winter or... All the varieties, and I haven't looked, I haven't looked in mm -hmm. detail, so I will go over there and have a t um, take some photographs, because we can probably kind of zoom in and identify what it is. Um, okay. But yeah, you will all know Wisteria, so let's, um, let's see if you know the next one. Mm. So this is an image from the bottom of my road and I just thought, wow, it's pow. All that blue and all that yellowy green. Um, and there's a bit of a piss of sporum in the, in the corner. Really, really clashy and vibrant. Um, and very common plants. Yeah, yeah. The Ceanothus, we're guessing that it's a cultivar called Cascade, but there's quite a few similar ones and um, I've only seen it from a photo, I, but I, I think it possibly is Cascade, but there, there's lots of evergreen blue flowered Ceanothus it's, um, that have slightly different habits, slightly different leaf shapes and sizes. Yeah. They flower amazingly, as you can see from that. Personally, see, I'm looking at the Euonymus Fortunii Emerald and Gold in the front. It's got a little bit of reversion going on. Yeah. That, that really, that's like, if you've got a hangover, that's going to hurt, that is, isn't it? Um, it's yeah. very zingy. It's all mm. a bit clashy. <sighs> yeah. I don't know whether I like it or not. It's just um, a little bit. No, I mean, oh, I, I'm, my eyes. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, it's like, please, stop. I'm, I'm on the verge of saying I don't really like it. But in, t in so in seasonality, talking about it's not all about flower, it's about foliage as well. It's really bright. I yeah. don't yeah. like Euonymus Fortunia Emerald to go, it is really useful. It is, not, you can keep it thing. as a small hedge, you can let it grow up a wall, you can do yeah. loads of things with it. But at this time of year, it does have that really vibrant yellow colour, whereas in the winter, it tends to be a little much duller. But also with red edging, if it gets cold enough, doesn't it? And that brings out the red on the leaf. Yeah. I mean, um, that's very good that you've noticed. I tried to not notice it. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, because it's so commonly planted and, and actually used Hello. inappropriately sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think there are things that could be used. But yeah, that's yellow and blue, definitely, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and this one, over, over to you. Well, that's because, you see, I think that this is a nicer euonymus. This is euonymus japonica sovartosaurus. Let me look in my... See, I've got my, I've got my pot of bits. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is in my front garden. Um, and it's a much... It's a bigger plant than Fortunii. The mm. leaves are much more shiny and waxy. They look bigger. And they are much bigger, probably two or three times the size. Yeah. Um, if you, it, you can let it flower or if you prune it, then you tend to get much bigger leaves. Um, so I kind of prune it for the leaves, but also because it's just an easy shrub to have in the front garden that I don't have to pay much attention to more than once a year. And um, it's interesting how those leaves have come out. So the older leaves look, have a green and white margin and they're coming out with the green and yellow. Yeah. So the colour's yeah. going to get knocked back. It's coming out and it's a bit bright. So that, that's an old leaf. Yeah. Ooh, that one. Slightly and prettier, then, isn't it? Yeah. And then you get the new leaf. So, yeah, there's, I, I just think that actually, I think that's a preferable euonymus to yeah. emerald and gold. But um, they're both evergreen and do their own thing. So, yeah. They are they are worthy background shrubs. Oh, background. And you can easily tell the difference between the two because of the leaf size and also the feel of the leaf. You, you want as fortune, I leaf feels much more like paper, and um, Japonica sovartosaurus much more wast, waxy, plasticky. Hmm. Hmm. That's good. Good comparison. Oh, right. Where are we next? Next one. Um, euphorbia. Mm. Um, this is a really, really handsome euphorbia. And what I, why I thought it was such a good photograph to take is because it was so even um, and round. You can see it in its completeness. It's a domey shape with that bright um, limey colour for this time of year. And the um, one on the right's a self set, isn't it? Yeah. And I think um, I know we. I, I've been talking a lot about weeds. If you look at the bottom of this picture here, you can see all the little seedlings. Oh yeah. Bottom. So um, this is these are in totally different areas. This is in um, um, Nunhead, Peckham, and this is Dulwich Village. Um, but you can, you, as the streets are not being sprayed. I'm seeing so many more of you know the weeds are much much bigger but I'm also seeing lots and lots of uh, cultivated plants growing in the cracks um, but also I, look, look at so where the one on the right is is growing that and it is just cracks in pavement so if you see something like that you immediately know it needs dry poor soil if you've yeah. got pretty rubbish soil that you know you know that's the plant for you isn't it because yeah that's what it needs it needs it, it thrives on on nothing and seeing this in turkey um growing wild is exactly that so it can live in impoverished dry soil and the leaves will indicate that as well so they're um fine leaflets with glaucous texture yeah silver uh, yeah Oh, and these are sort of bracts, aren't they? Not flowers. Yes, the the flowers are um, tiny. They're just held in those kind of uh, yellowy green bracts. A really interesting architectural shrub. Yeah. Um, and you can see that fatinia in the back going for it. So it's quite um, a striking combination there. Um, well, one way you can always identify a euphorbia as well is when you break the stem, it always has milky sap, which is slightly toxic and irritant. So yes, yeah, wear a glove when you do it. Yeah, um, top tip for health and safety. And also, after a while, these can look a bit ropey. So the reason why I like this one because I thought, oh, it's really handsome. It's kind of nice and even, not ropey. Whereas yeah, they can get quite woody, can't they? If you don't yeah. cut them back, at least in sections. And I'm always interested in the idea of sub shrubs. So this is as classified as a sub shrub, isn't it? Yeah. So like Artemisia, I suppose as well. Yeah. yeah. Things like that. So, so things that are are woody, but also quite 
a cross between woody and herbaceous which is yes nice. i don't know what what is the description of a sub i don't know but i kind of kind of know that they are and it's, yeah. a, it's a twilight zone in um... because they can form woody stems but they're not actually shrubs they die down each year i suppose essentially don't they not that they yeah. do in this country now but some of them do so we'll, all, we'll come back to you on that one because we need to have a it's all, always been a bit wishy-washy but there's something about sub shrubs that that they give you some well, euphorbia it gives you some structure but it isn't the normal um they're kind of a lower size and they're not as woody and as familiar looking as normal shrubs this is very wishy-washy like i can hear myself <laughs> I yeah, I suppose they don't have a woody stemmed framework, do they? No, and they're coming from the, this is all coming from the base. Yeah, from a crown. I do want to stop talking about it because yes. I feel like move I'm digging on, myself a hole. Yes, move on to the next one. Um, oh, rosemary. Mm. I, don't you also think how clever Claire is having done this PowerPoint where it's still got us two in the corner? We, <laughs> like, Seriously, worked that out about half an hour ago. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, it's a good way because I I don't have um I don't have a garden that could um support our interest. But the map, the thing about walking around, it is there's so much material. Yeah. Like it was there's this there's so much stuff to take photos of. Like non-stop. Every time I go out, my battery goes flat because I've just got twelve thousand images of plants i mean so um, with the rosemary though you've got two separate pictures there and they are two different um species of rosemary yeah but one's a hedge and the other's essentially is that coming over a wall it is and it's um cascading over a wall and it does and, and the fact that it's called um 7c it's for me, it has a lot of movement. It's a lovely name. It really reflects the kind of choppy water of um, of the sea. I um, love it. But what's really great in terms of seasonality, so it's aromatic, the foliage, but it's in flower quite early and it's flowering for a long time. Yeah. Um, and it's covered in bees. Covered in bees. <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, you, you, you'll all be able to recognise it. You'll know the scent and everything. But again, it's looking at those sort of almost needle-like leaves and the fact that they're, they're silver and narrow. That's yeah. because they come from areas in the world where there's, not, there's often drought. So looking at that type of leaf, and that type of, if you've got dry soil, again, or even if, you know, you're actually just a bit rubbish at watering, <laughs> they're the plants for you um so there's there's lots of things to consider there um that that they're not they're not going to want a really rich fertile soil um um they're going to be happy in sand yeah. sandy soils chalky soils um but but dry soils and and, and they're very good at putting up with wind as well i've been watching this hedge develop over a few years um Andrew's eight and we've been right going up and down this road on his scooter for ages and it's doing really really well in the last three years it's really grown but and it's very solid yeah so it's it's thing, yeah every year right on a main road as it's well. a good for catching pollution as well that will be yeah now dense leaves and and um I you know kind of I brush past it every time that's good next what's next oh over to you yeah so on my way to the off license <laughs> i wasn't i was um so <laughs> this is sambucus um probably actually in a lot of places it will still be sold as black lace yeah, um, but that's how i kind of remember yeah, that it's actually an iga porphyrpathula eva um <laughs> so that's the plant breeders rights thing and but anyway it is a fabulous plant so it's all feathery and lovely and dissected yeah Actually, you can tell i don't know where the camera is can't you <laughs> can you see um the flower there yeah so you've got it just see it down here at the bottom here and you know they'll be out soon so they're lovely yeah. and pink plates of flower yeah. 
that sort of the frothy plates of flour and yeah. it will be covered in these they they start off pink and open up white so you get a sort of pinky white haze mm. and it does have berries on um so it's got a huge amount going for it um because it's got the foliage color it's got the flowers which insects love and then you've got the berries which other um animals birds love them and you can make um wine out of elderberries you can actually use the if they are toxic you have to cook them i should say that um and you can use the flowers for flavoring as well but yeah never have. Um, um but um, it's a fab plant um and if you've got soil if you've got clay soil that's wet in the winter and dry in the summer stick one of these in they poke uh, up with anything the um the berries and actually um sambucus nigra just the standard i took a photo of that this morning um i just really i really like eldon i like the fact that i can hard prune it you can get really big and then i can hard prune it and then it'll come back and i can manage the size yeah and um, you don't have to prune it every year do you if you forget to prune it for two or three years and you think oh my god yeah. my sambucus eva is now um 15 foot you know four yeah. or five meters tall then you know it takes hard mm. pruning regenerative pruning you can prune it back down to a meter and let all of this lovely new vigorous growth come it, it actually does do it good to be pruned that one yeah, um, yeah. but that's yeah fab so plant you can have with these nice the kind of lacy lacy leaves having some kind of larger contrasting leaves it gives you a good opportunity to experiment with foliage i can't remember what was next to it but i obviously didn't like it very much because i made sure it was out of the picture it doesn't um i can't really is it some old dodgy choisier it does look like it we think we, <laughs> we dissed choisier enough last week didn't we yeah <laughs> oh there's lovely flowers at the moment mm, um, yeah not right. an Aztec pearl though. Oh, yeah, oh, this, okay, another one of fun. mine. Another one of mine. Right. So, Wegela Florida. Now, again, these will grow pretty much anywhere, um, and they have ooh, lovely flowers on. But they flower on previous seasons' wood. So the the growth that they've put on last summer is what has the flowers on this spring. So they're kind of the, the leaves are quite boring for the rest of the year actually they don't look much so they should be very much uh, a structure background shrub you don't want them at the front of a border necessarily they flower their hearts out for three weeks yeah that's about I, it i think they're also at this early stage so they're the beginning of the for me and i think okay with gila then we've got deutzia philadelphus it's i kind of have that um i start thinking about like summer's really coming yeah it's like the first of it um and the the pinks i, I saw a lovely dark burgundy yeah. one and oh, then it's, it's very yeah. one. i really like it yeah actually common, it's very much common. paler pink flower but variegated so this is wigila florida variegata the one you're talking about i think is that um bristol ruby yeah but yeah, um, lots going for it. Now I've got a question for you. This flowering on previous seasons growth, oh we know that they do, right? So you you know, don't if you don't prune them, it doesn't matter. They'll just the growth they put on this summer will be flowering next next spring. Yeah. And that's why they get older and woodier and, mm. and taller and taller, and you tend to get a lot of flower at the top. And that happens on things like Forsythia as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Why? Why is? Why do we bang on? Or you should prune out a third of it. Why not? Why not half of it? Why not three quarters of it? Because it stops it getting woody. If you um, prune that down each year and let, because this is what we do on a nursery. You prune because when you want to sell that three liter plant, you don't have any woody stems on it. No, I would never. Um, I would never do it by a third. I actually heard one of my students talking about this the other day, and I just thought, oh no, I take, uh, I'll do it in rotation. So I look, crouch down, look at the base, and then see which are the old fat stems that need to be taken out and i take them right down to the base because i know yeah. it's a nice arching habit um i want it to look good in winter i'll use it as a structural shrub so i don't like that thing in thirds i like it right from the bottom and nice and arching 
Yeah, and me too. I just, I, same with Forsythia. I just, so then you, because you're leaving two thirds of the woody old, I don't know, I just yeah. don't get yeah. it. Um, um, and, and so you've got to prune it it's, oh, the whole way around. You've got to look at the whole thing, take out the woodiest yeah. stems. We will do a demonstration of this, um, actually, when these have finished flowering. Yeah. <laughs> so that means me. It going into a neighbour's garden and secretly pruning their wee gila for them. But there's some in the park that I really want to get hold of. Um, there are. I've, I've taken some photographs because I want... Is that gorilla pruning? Yeah. Um, but we want some elegance rather than all that congested old stuff at the top because then yeah. it's a really quite, um, you know, an average shrub, which is kind of really kind of lovely. Yeah. Well, wee gila gets a bit of a knocking. It does, but, but it actually does. it's got a lot going for it. Again, it'll grow in any soil most aspects it, you know it doesn't like shade but yeah. you know that's it yeah. so yeah, uh, go for it there oh this is this is one of your ones mm. see this is where i'm going to get a bit nerdy <laughs> so this is a, a rhododendron yakushimena fcc form so this is one of the that sound like a football club oh, oh yeah <laughs> fcc hurst pier point Okay. Anyway, shush now, Lakey, shush, concentrate. <laughs> I'm listening because so, I'm going to learn. I know nothing about rhododendrons deliberately. So these are dwarf rhododendrons. Um, so this is um, the species. I think it was brought back in the late 40s um, and um, probably by a Rothschild, I think. Oh. Anyway, it's the parent of a lot of the um, hybrids that you get in garden centers and a lot of fabulous hybrids but i think that it's it's better than its offspring um because it's just fabulous when the the buds are tight they're like they're pink and then it opens to white so right now i've i could barely bring myself to cut that flower off um <laughs> and it doesn't show it to its full but bees go in that and like the entire bumblebee will be inside that <laughs> now and and then you just get these bumblebee bums like <laughs> hanging out of all the single flowers but it's been in that pot for 23 years well i'm sold because of the bumblebee bums yeah it's <laughs> I'm fabulous. Sold. that's it i will start talking to people about this now so just, just yeah just feed it from sort of may to july um with a liquid feed once or twice a week and it just does absolutely fabulously um, I've never, I never repotted. It. it just goes to show how long you can leave something in a pot is what I'm trying to say. It's probably doubled in size in that time. It's very slow growing, but you must deadhead them. When these flowers are finished, you must twist them off. But look at this, look at this. Can you see, can you see all the brown furriness under oh, yeah. there? On yeah. the bottom of the leaf. So they've all underneath the leaf got this sort of, um, it's called indumentum. We're very always excited, but it's very really fluffy oh it's i don't know why i'm doing that it does nothing to my face but it's what's really the word what's it what's the, the word indumentum oh i'm gonna have to look that up so okay. underneath you've got all this brown furriness and then on the top i think this is called tomentum i should have looked it up before um i said so in the winter the leaves have got this other protective coating. Oh, I can see fur. it on here. Look, I can see it on there, right there. Yeah, yeah. So you get that in the winter. It looks fabulous. Um, and then you get the flowers in the spring. Um, but the new leaves are all furry as well. All sort of, they're just, it's just perfect plant. Perfect and how plant. come you are into rhododendron yukushi manum? How, do you have a thing about rhododendrons in general? Yeah, I love rhododendrons. I love magnolias, rhododendrons, camellias yeah. a little bit, yeah. Well, actually, um, now I might go up to Dulwich Park. There's one, there's, I took a lovely photo of a yellowy orangey rhodo this morning, but Dulwich Park will have loads. So that, that's given me some uh, incentive to go up there. Because you yeah, I mean, maybe... obviously, there's rhododendron ponticum is a, 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 it's a pernicious weed in this country, isn't it? I think it's... Yeah. But I scared, yeah so it, it's it has to be eradicated in certain places and but so you know, in, it's in Dulwich woods thing. up here it will be be taken out it'll be a real yeah a real pain but um this but is if great. you've got not a lot of space 
for pot, this is the perfect rhododendron. Mm. I'm yeah. very interested in all that um, tactile, leafy stuff. I know. It's... That's good, isn't it? Um, right, I'm going to do the next one, but you can do another rodo show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is me. I just like saying bearded iris. But um I know like, nothing about iris, so over to you. No, I don't know a huge amount apart from that they they like the bake soil. Um mm. they're around in a kind of a I love that felcate shaped leaf. That's a really interesting contrast to a lot of frothy geraniums and geranium phaeum. But I just saw this on a walk at the top of a hill um overlooking london so it's quite um that's a fabulous photo on the right isn't it i just thought just amazing like there's, there's so many different colors out at the moment i could just take an hour of just um iris looking at people's front gardens but the textures but i also the designer in me likes the lines and the patterns of the of the stone behind the concrete behind mm. do you know why i'm frightened of them why is that what? when i was uh, doing my apprenticeship at oxford botanic gardens there was uh one of the um gardeners the iris beds the bearded iris but and there was another type of iris can't remember what that was in charge of them it was very scary and and like the apprentices you weren't allowed near these irises and and like even if you walked past the bed so you would be like what are you doing I said, i'm just going to get some lunch um he was very protective of his irises and um, the um chelsea flower show there have been some like amazing stands where the colors are super elegant the um they are they look like um once I described them, it's like a like a photo shoot from Vogue. The colours were just like cashmere coat colours and tans and whites and baby pink. Wow, that's all on one plant, all on one flower. So I just pretty, I just love the graphic of it. Yeah. I just think it's a real mindfulness opportunity just to stare at those um, plants. It was right in someone's front garden and then someone did come out and I walked off. Because <laughs> it was about half seven in the morning. Um, oh. I'll go. Next one. Oh, and actually the next door garden. So, so there was something about this garden. It was very hot, sunny, all south facing. And the Sinara, which is the silvery leaves plant here, the cardoon. Um, I think it looks great this time of year. August, it's just all covered in black fly and it's all getting a bit tatty and exhausted. But now with these lovely silvery leaves, um, so that with that iris next door, these kind of front gardens mesh together. Again, um, you've got that silver leaf um, will withstand really hot summers. Um, yeah that Mediterranean type planting. It's actually quite spiny, isn't it, Sinoa? Yeah. Um, you don't, as the leaves get older, you don't realise when you go to cut them down, because they're, they're, like the new leaves aren't spiny, but then if you look further down, they, down they become there. quite spiky. Yes. When you go to cut them down, I always forget and go, ow, every And that's year. why I, I always, remember. People used to see me, oh, it's really hot. Why are you wearing your full gear? That long, if you're doing it professionally, long sleeves all year round because mm. all these things that look kind of soft, you just got, they've got little hairs on and they kind of get hold of your skin. But you can see here on this side, you've got the stack is a bit of stack is Byzantina. And then we've got this kind of, um, this lovely centuria. I always, but some some clients of mine used to think of this as a weed. Yeah, which is such a shame. I mean, that's clearly a cultivar. I don't know what cultivar, but actually, even if you've got it as a weed in your garden, keep it. Yeah, I and mean, bees love it. Yeah. But I just thought this was a really magical combination of these silvery blues, um, you know, maybe some happy accidents in there, just meshing together. And these tulips. Well, that combination would be great for a seaside garden as well. Uh, yeah. That's, you know, good, good coastal planting. And when, and maybe this stuff has thrived so well because it's very windy at the top of the hill. So, mm. yeah. 
So contrasting, this is very a contrasting um, polygonatum cross hybridum or Solomon seal. It's unusual to see it before the lily beetle strips it. So get, I got in there quickly with a um, with a. You photo. can see a lily beetle down there on the right hand side. Can you see? Is that a lily beetle at the bottom? There. Yeah. I don't know. I'll have to kind of zoom in. Um, oh no, I think it's a bit of something from there was um, a birch, an uh, ulnus above this. Oh right. A bit of a catkin from that. But I could go back and take a photograph, and I would be surprised to see it looking good like this. Um, yeah. I really like it. So it's shady, arching stems. And it reminds me a bit of something that I haven't seen for years, uv Uvularia. You know, it's a similar oh, kind of yeah. a similar kind of thing. Yeah, I haven't seen it for years. Um that also I think gets eaten by um This is very old fashioned, isn't it? In my head, that's what my nan had. I don't yeah. think she did. <laughs> no, but, but, it, but they yeah. are they are I think they're kind of I know town what you mean by that. Garden, yeah, town gardens. Um yeah. yeah. You, you don't it's got an interesting often. flavour to it, but it's it's kind of being you don't see much of it now. And I don't see much of it looking good because the lily beetle gets it, I think. Yeah. But um, like you say, for shade, ground cover, it's very effective, isn't it? Yeah. It kind of is in a group of plants for me, which I put with um epimediums, hellebores, you know, I've been and and this is very reflective of how I've been taught. So <laughs> I love a bit of shade, uh, shady planting. It's kind of my favourite. Um yeah, because yeah. it's not very often done well, is it, shade planting? No, no, a shady ground cover, we're going to come to that. Um, so on, this is my, um, talking about kind of granny plants, I love a bit of Aubrecia and I love Who doesn't? That, yeah, I think it's really great and it's like kind of heart-shaped clump. I thought it was really perfect pincushion just hanging on there like a big swarm of bees. Um, I think Aubrey is very pretty, but very granny. Love it. We should say we because there's so many hybrids of Aubrey. We've just put the genus name up. We could take many wild guesses as to what cultivar that is, but yeah. it could be so many. So I think they used to be Aubrey deltoides, but the hybrids now is it's all mm -hmm. the parentage is a bit lost in the mists of time. Yeah, um, like hookers, isn't it? So, um, oh gosh, I gosh, I don't know about hookers. This, yeah. I, I love the fact that it, like that Rosemarinus prostratus at the front, it kind of softens, cascades over walls. It's um clothing a wall. It's like a yes. fabric. It's it's really um great for kind of bringing spaces alive in a very soft. Software. Yeah, it softens that wall. That wall's quite harsh, isn't it? Yeah, and mi and a mishmash. I just yeah. thought it was very. It's just growing very evenly. It's arranged itself perfectly to catch the sun. It, probably with no intervention. Looking yeah. at the rest of the garden. Yeah, garden. <laughs> that's not to say that's not nice. But that yeah. sounded really awful. Oh, <laughs> you're so snobby. You're so. <laughs> I will oh, never take this, a photo of mine. This is super, super, um, super mum and dad. My mum and dad, this is not my mum and dad's, um, but my mum and dad had one and it was there for about 40 years on the corner. <laughs> so if my brother and sister are watching this, there was that one by the gatepost and it was there for 50 years. So they, your brother and sister will know what Ibera Sempervirens is. They'll Should we know, test them, will they? Yes, they know that it's that stuff by the front door. Yeah. It is, again, a fabulous, and that will grow in the cracks in pavements. Um, it's very easy to grow. Yeah. And Loves it's soft, full sun. Yeah, softening. Yeah. It's just taking, knocking the edges off. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to do a sort of much bigger, or well, not much, but another podcast on ground cover. We'll probably include those two again. Apologies if I was looking away just now. All of my things had fallen out of the glass. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap up this one with, I hope you've enjoyed it, but we're really trying to look at plants that you're going to be seeing when you go for your walk. So we're going to do 
ground cover, so things that might be trailing over walls, but things that are going to prevent you needing to weed. Because um, yeah. let's face it, it is quite boring re weeding, isn't it? So the less you have to do a bit, the better. Um, and hedges we were going to talk about in the next one or two podcasts as well. Mm. And climbers. Oh, and climbers. Oh, God, we have got a lot oh, to talk about. And, and also I want to do trees, but then I've just like let the cat out of the back. I honestly I'm just like bursting with the amount of stuff that I've just I've got to take a picture of this and this and that and that so we've got to just kind of manage it but I'm you know I'm, I'm very interested I'm enjoying looking at this and I think both of us are, are still working full-time and um yeah. pretending that we've got loads of time to do this is a little bit silly <laughs> and um I enjoyed um knowing about um the hairy undersides of <laughs> I think I think hairy undersides doesn't really sell it, does it? <laughs> right, on that bombshell. <laughs> we will see you next time. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. Have you stopped it? No.